Here we go. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Lacey. I'm the founder and CEO of Chairman Me, um, which is basically an online learning community for badass women. Um, we teach a lot of online courses, and a lot of those really have to do with the topic of today's talk, which is about owning your motherhood, making it part of your story as a leader. Now, why is it so important to have a story as a leader? I, I mean, obviously, if you are a founder, if you are raising money, if you are trying to hire people, if you are trying to build a nonprofit and give people to give you donations, anyone you are asking for something that is a scarce, finite um, resource for them, including their time, you need to have a story because narrative is what convinces people to go along with us, to invest in us um, with whatever scarce resource that is. It's never data. It's never facts. Um, it is it is always narrative. I'm a big believer that anything that you were trying to hide because you think it makes you less than the ideal of that thing is exactly what you should be embracing for your narrative, including motherhood. So I want to um, talk a little bit about the how with that, because I think if you're at an event called Motherhood on the Resume, you're probably sold on the why. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the how in this session, and then we'll get to questions. And I'm going to leave you with an exercise at the end that we won't have time to do in this session, but I want you to do it. And accountability, I want you to email me when it's done. And I will give you 30 second feedback. I don't care if 10,000 of you email me, I will do it because you need an accountability partner who's there waiting on you to send that exercise. And I am volunteering. I should say before I go any further, I am at a fasting wellness retreat in the desert right now. Um, I'm two days in and I've had about 300 calories. So I'm going to be looking at a script and if I suddenly keel over, that is why. See what I did there? Answer is the obstacle. I was worried about the fact that I'm under calorie giving a presentation to all of you today. And instead, I owned it up front. And Alina's like, wow, super cool. Exactly. Now you think I'm a human being. Now you're going to be impressed when I don't fall over at the end of this presentation. Instead of being like, what is up with her? Why is she so spacey? Obstacle is always the answer. That is my core, core, core lesson. I say in every course we teach about storytelling, fundraising, self-promotion, whatever it is, you're opening your mouth to get people to do what you want. All right. So let's talk about motherhood specifically. How on earth? Did we let the patriarchy convince us that giving birth, something that pushes the boundaries of the human experience and strength and patience and love is a weakness? I fully believed this before I had kids. I put off having kids for like a decade because I believed the second I had children, I would no longer be able to attend a meeting without vomit on my sleeve. I'd be distracted. I have the brain that I have now after not eating for two days. Um, I would not also, the thing that was scariest to me was this message that I wouldn't care about work anymore. I wouldn't be ambitious. Every single thing that I had spent my life working towards would suddenly not matter, matter to me, quote unquote, when I held that baby in my arms. This biological imperative would take over like some body, of, body snatchers moment. I had a career of taking a ton of risk, but that felt like the biggest risk I could ever take because it felt like it was risking myself. Um, so I achieved and achieved and achieved and achieved so that... <clears throat> If all this happened when I had a baby, fine. I had, I had lived my career best life. And guess what? This is not going to surprise any of the mothers in the audience. I guarantee you. The opposite happened. I became better at so much stuff. And was it hard? Yes, it's obviously hard. But just like we fetishize running a startup or running an ultra marathon, things that push you to your limit develop new strengths in you. And I would say working motherhood is the ultimate because it goes on for about 18 years it changes with every stage. Um, I was so struck by this disconnect of what I was told by the world about being a working mom and what I experienced as a working mom that I set out to write my book, A Uterus is a Feature, Not a Bug, which came out in, uh, see, this is where the fast brain's coming in, 2018, I believe, um, because I wanted to, as a journalist, understand, was this just me? Was there data that backed this up? Um, why did we, and, and why does society gaslight us into that? I mean, we need to propagate the species. Every once in a while, we see these alarmist articles that women aren't having enough babies. Why are we having enough babies? 
Well, I mean, it, it could be all of this shit that culture's feeding us. So I want to understand why it happens. I want to understand the data around it. And if I was an outlier and, you know, I won't give you all the results in the next uh, 45 minutes because it was a long book, but um, these are some of the highlights. And I want you to think about these and internalize them as you think about owning your narrative of being a working mom. I mean, the first one is not going to surprise anyone. Productivity. Um, this is obvious. We suddenly have to take care of like living beings when we already thought all of our hours were accounted for. But there's data to back this up too. The Federal Reserve Bank of all places did a study on productivity in the workplace and found that working mothers are the most productive members of the workforce. Now, sure, if you have a top, if you have a baby right now or a newborn, you're like, no way. Okay, so right after your baby is born, you take a productivity hit. But that productivity hit is about 15%. It is not as dramatic as we like to think when we're saying, oh, so-and-so can't be promoted because she just had a baby. It's about 15%. After that early, early childhood stage, your productivity races above any other demographic in the workforce. Now, I would argue given companies invest in all kinds of corporate training to make their employees better performers, that 15% beyond propagating the species is well worth the investment of good paid leave, flexible work time, everything else that they may do to accommodate you to get the most productive members of the workforce. Now, the interesting thing is Fathers also got a productivity boost, but nowhere near as large as mothers. And with mothers, the more kids they had, the more productive they became. With fathers, there was no additional bonus for kids. Um, given we live, like it or not, in a capitalist society where everything is measured on productivity, that's a pretty clear guidance that being working mom is a superpower. Um, another one is empathetic leadership. Now, before I ran Chairman Me, I was an investigative journalist for 20 years. Newsrooms are not a kind, cuddly place. It is a place where you are motivated by tight deadlines and screaming. I was not a particularly empathetic manager because we had a publication to put out every day. I used to always say when we were building TechCrunch and then later Pando that journalism startups are the ultimate iterative startup because it has to reinvent you know, on a minute by minute basis sometimes. Um, but when I had children, I had to learn to lead in a totally different way. You cannot get a child to potty train by threatening to fire them. <laughs> I'm guessing. I didn't actually try. I'm actually quite a nice mom. Um, but being a mother, as my kids grew and faced new challenges and new challenges and still are at eight and 10, nine and 10, sorry, we just had a birthday. Um, I had to really learn how to meet each of them where they are. And my job as their mom is to enable their greatness, enable their greatness to exist in this flawed world we have. And that's my job as a boss too. I need to bring out everyone on my team's greatness. And that if I had never had children, I would have never developed the skills to do that. It was a total reset on what leadership and management is psychological balance. Here's the hard thing about entrepreneurship. And I know not everyone here is an entrepreneur, but I know a bunch of you are. You have to care enough about what you're doing that you will walk through fire to achieve it. But you haven't have to have enough distance to immediately shake off the failure and keep going because there are constant failures. You fail every day when you're trying to build something out of nothing, especially if you are under-resourced as an underrepresented founder. Um, what was great to me about having kids is it gave me something that I loved more than work for the first time in my life. My kids were the only thing that could pull me out of a doom spiral tailspin about work that wasn't serving anyone. Um, I could switch work off when they'd run in to hug me at the end of a long day. It would give me the distance of, okay, the world isn't ending. How do we solve this problem? And when you get to the acceptance phase of whatever's happening, that's when you can solve the problem. And I will say, as my kids have gotten older, um, they're actually like partners in this for me. And this was one of the gifts of the pandemic of my kids actually seeing what I do all day long versus assuming that like Han Solo, I just went into frozen carbonite once they went to school and then was thawed out to take care of their needs again. Um, I, they know all signs 
days of when I am getting really stressed out with work. And um, during the last time we were doing remote schooling, um, they actually like created a break room for me. They um, did a bubble bath. They moved like a table in there. Uh, they put flowers and some books and magazines and some tea. And they like pulled me out aside after my meeting. And they were like, what do you have to do in the next 30 minutes? And I was like, well, I've got to catch up on stuff. And they're like, nope, you're taking a break. You're stressed out and you're taking a break. So they've actually become um, my partners in this. And I think it's pretty cool that we've had the opportunity to model the importance of that. Um, all right, three more. Um, so I... <laughs> I think one of the biggest things that holds women back is this, um, how we have been conditioned since a young age to be liked. We are so obsessed with being liked. Now, as a journalist, I was really lucky that it was my job to be hated. And so, but you know, there's still that conditioning and it's, it, it can be a little bit of a challenge, right? I have always been someone that people thought didn't care about being liked. I've always had thick skin, but after having children, I was way more okay being hated because when you have young children, they are such amazing social manipulators and social hackers. Um, when a child tells you, you know, you're being unfair, uh, cries, stops, you don't love them as much. They hate you. They storm out of the room and you have to hold firm in the face of that and still do the right thing and still have your boundary and still have your punishment and still be able to step outside your emotions and see the reason that they're acting this way is because um, they are trying to manipulate me and it's a sign that what I'm doing is important. I have to tell you as someone who was an investigative journalist dealing with bro man children who I was costing billions of dollars and were doing everything, including threatening our advertisers, threatening investors, um, having actual threats against my family. It was really, really easy to hold that line because if Eli is going to storm out of the room and be pissed at me and I'm cool with it, I don't really care how Travis Kalanick feels about me because Eli's about a million times more important. I think also whenever we went through really hard things, um, whenever we did have threats, which hopefully is not any part of any of your jobs, it's no longer part of my job, thank God. I did also feel like, well, you fall into these situations in your career of, am I going to cave or am I going to keep going? And sometimes, you know, in terms of self-care, you should cave. None of us are sacrificial lambs. Um, there are times that is the right answer. But I will say my journey as a working mom started out when I was on maternity leave at TechCrunch. I was supposed to come back and be the editor in chief. Um, Ariana Huffington decided to give my job away while I was in labor. Um, afterwards, they offered me tons of money, more money than I had ever made and any salary, of, I mean, any title other than that one to return because there was such a shit storm over it in the community. Um, and I was faced with a choice. Do I want to have a huge salary and an easy life and go into a place that feels like they owe me? Or do I want to stand up for the fact that this woman stole my job while I was in labor and wasn't making it right? And, you know, I'll be honest with you. I was pretty burned out as a journalist then. If I didn't have kids, I might have taken the paycheck because I had kids or a kid at that time, I looked at Eli and I felt like I'm now Eli's role model of what being a woman in this world is. It has made me make harder decisions more, even when those decisions have cost me money. And I think moms get that, but I think people who aren't moms think moms are so harried and need money and need security that they would take the easy answer. It doesn't happen that much. All right, two more. So confidence. We all suffer from imposter syndrome. I don't care if you're a woman. I don't care if you are a mother. Everyone does. White men have imposter syndrome. It is hard to go out to a world and constantly be projecting, 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 and feeling inside, can I really pull this off, right? And it's especially the case, obviously, if you're an underrepresented person, it is especially the case when you have essentially named yourself the boss of your own company, no one else has given you that title. No one other than me has ever given me a title like CEO. That's a ballsy move, right? So how then do we think about um, wrestling that imposter syndrome? For me, and every, I know everyone doesn't feel this way, but having kids reaffirm that I should always listen to my instincts. Um, I, um, 
I am incredibly good at being a mother. I naturally know the right thing to do as a mother. I feel really grounded and confident as a mother. And I'm not saying I'd be the right mother for everyone's children, but I am a thousand percent the right mother for my children. And those wins that I have when I help them out of a hard situation, and I have this answer no one else did, that just like reaffirms to me, I know what I'm doing. And no one's gonna gaslight me. Just like these are my children, this is my company, and I know what I'm doing. That bedrock of confidence in something else has really helped me through those times. I'll give you a quick example. My um, eldest, Eli, had severe anxiety getting on planes. I was a single mom with two kids 18 months apart, and I had to get them on three connecting flights to see their grandparents for Christmas. Um, This was not an easy feat. And what I came up with was this idea that when we're dressed in costumes, we feel more confident, and it also distracts us from fear. So for five years, every time we got on a flight, me and Eli and Evie dressed in head-to-toe matching Japanese onesies. Um, We looked ridiculous. I got free drinks on every flight. It absolutely solved the problem. You are able to pull solutions out of thin air when you are a mother and your kids need something, and it gives you the confidence and, frankly, the muscle memory to do that at work again and again and again. I have seen this in my ability to iterate, create a problem solve, and come up with new solutions on the job. It is a muscle that you exercise in, in, you know, it's that phrase, do, do anything like you would do everything. It's a muscle you exercise in your personal life and your, uh, your professional life. Um, all right, last one. Entrepreneurship, and this is just for entrepreneurs, is all about working in constraints and doing more with less. I mean, read any bro autobiography, listen to any venture capitalist. They will tell you this is why scrappy companies always upend industries and beat big companies, working in constraints, doing more with less. Uh, Working mothers in COVID, I mean, that was a boot camp in that shit. So, you know, I give you all of these tangible examples so that you can have something to remind yourself when you know innately that you are a badass because you're a working mother and it is making you better at your job, but other people are trying to gaslight you that that's not the case. You now have six, and if you look at my book, you can have da- you can find data from every single one of these. It's not just anecdotal. You now have six bullet points that you can remind yourself. Yep, check. I did do more than anyone else today. Check, I am an instinctive creative leader. These are all things that we all share as working mothers and reasons to be proud and to own that. Um, Now, as you can see from the story about the the onesies on the airplanes, um, this is really a personal story. You need to dig deep into your own journey as a mother. Part of my story as a work as a mother is that my eldest is transgender and that has given me so many rich areas to grow and so many challenges. And it's something that I talk about a lot because I'm really, really proud of her, first of all. But it's also that something that I talk about a lot because it has probably changed me more than almost anything else in my life. Maybe you're a mom of a neurodiverse kid. Maybe you're a mom of, um, you know, maybe you've uh, adopted a a kid who's of a different race, Um, you know, or maybe you just have like my second child, a ferocious badass of a child that you're trying to keep right on that fine line of advocating for herself, but not being a total asshole. Whatever is your story of motherhood, own that. A good friend of mine in the Chairman Me community, Amanda Monday, had a a terrible experience with postpartum depression after having her child, was actually had her baby taken away and was institutionalized in a psych ward for nine days. She's a founder, y'all. Did she hide that? No, she wrote a best-selling book about it. This is what I'm talking about. Everyone reads that and they're like, wow, she's incredible. Whereas if someone had walked around saying, oh, did you hear Amanda was once in a psych ward? Ooh, totally different how you own this story but it's just as much about how you talk about it with others as self-talk and honestly self-talk may be the most important part of this when you look at yourself in the mirror at the end of a hard day 
a day that is absolutely the world and your children and maybe your ex-husband and everyone else has just kicked the shit out of you? Do you see someone who's bedraggled or do you see someone who's badass? Because when I would get to drop off at preschool as a single mom running a journalist organization and I would, my kids had socks, whether they matched or not, they had clean clothes, they had a lunchbox and I got them there remotely on time. I felt like Laura Croft after she had just jumped across a huge cavern. I think it is astounding what we achieve every day as working moms, especially when you get notes like science fair next week, do all these things. I don't know how we do this, but we somehow do this. And on your worst day, you should look at yourself the way you would look at yourself if you had just finished an ultra marathon. I bet your hair is out of place. I bet you're sweaty and gross, but I bet you are glowing with this pride of fuck you, I just conquered that. Sorry, as this goes on, I'm swearing more. They're gonna have to bleep all this in the replay. Um, and here's the thing before I wrap up, you have to help, sometimes it helps to understand the neuroscience behind this. Your brain is not your friend. Your brain doesn't want you to be happy. Your evolutionary brain wants you to be alive. So your brain gives you a narrative that isn't based about making you feel good. Your brain is giving you a narrative to help keep you alive. Okay, so what does that mean? You're in a meeting, you announce that you're pregnant and someone like goes, ooh, or has some reaction or everyone else applauds, but one guy is a jerk. What does your brain do? It elevates that guy because your brain is saying to you, uh-oh, danger sign, this guy might make you lose your livelihood. When that happens, you literally evolutionary like blood rushes to your thighs so that you can run or fight. This is hard coded in our DNA. This is our conscious brain at work. And yay, thanks for keeping us alive. But you can edit your brain. These stories that your brain serves up out of survival usually aren't true. They're overinflated, they're worst case scenario, and you can edit them. When you're, it's the rough draft. When your brain gives you a story like, I can't be as good of a manager because I have a baby. Stop and examine that. The second you think it, we all have these stories we tell ourselves. Stop and examine it. Write down evidence that it's true, evidence that it's not true. Actually look at the facts and think about whether this story your brain is giving you is true. There is, you may not be able to work a thousand hours a day, but you're way more productive and you're not wasting a bunch of time. Great. Like, actually look at it because probably it's not true. And the more you practice this, the next time the, that thought comes up, you'll catch it. I'll give you an example. I used to always fall into this pattern of, I'm the only one doing this. No one else cares as much as me. I'm all alone. And like, you know, look, I grew up poor. I've been an underrepresented founder. I got divorced with two young kids. There's reasons my brain feels that pattern is true, but it's not. I have an amazing partner. I have an amazing dog sitter. I have had amazing uh, people who have helped me at every stage on my journey. I have incredible investors, a super supportive board of directors. Um, I have a technical team at Chairman Me that's so incredible. I don't really understand what they do as a writer and I've never needed to because they always deliver incredible product um, ahead of schedule. Like the, the, I, the narrative simply isn't true that I'm all alone and that I'm doing this all alone and that no one's there for me. It just isn't true. But my brain fires it up because those are the scariest moments in my past and it wants to make sure I don't relive them. So now when it happens, I immediately pause and think, okay, that's my brain doing that thing. Thank you very much, brain. Have a seat. I'm gonna keep on with my day. It's an amazing practice that is so vital to getting rid of this gaslighting we are surrounded by. All right, I gotta wrap up so we, wrap up so we can do questions. Um, here's the exercise that I want you to do, and I want you to do it. I'm gonna be waiting for your emails. There's 34 of you here, so I better get 34 emails. I'm your accountability buddy here. How do you craft a story where motherhood is central to what you do? It is your one line truth. It is wrapped together. It's no longer me as mom, me as work. It is the same sentence. And how do you project that to the world? So here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna take time to write down five ways you have gotten better at your job as a result of being a mother. That's it. 
You don't have to write a nice tagline. You don't have to write a nice narrative. You don't have to come up with clever wordplay. I want you to write down five tangible ways you've gotten better at your job as a result of being a mother. Email me at Sarah Lacey, not Sarah Lacey, that's my whole name. Email me at Sarah at chairmanme.com, Sarah with an H. I'm going to put it in the chat. Oh, Lindsay did it for me because I want to see it. And I'm going to give you 30 second feedback of this is how it becomes your narrative. Um, and just having that list, having someone see it and validate it, it's going to start rewiring that fear-based brain. Um, if you want to go deeper on any of this, we have so many courses at Chairman Me that are about editing your brain to avoid burnout and set boundaries. One's about storytelling. One's about honing your narrative, either for your company and your launch. We have an incredible course about the art of self-promotion, which every single woman on earth should take. Um, we have so much that ties into all of this, which is one reason I was so excited to do this workshop for Hey Mama, because owning your motherhood and not being ashamed of it is really the bedrock of our entire company's mission. And again, last thing I'll, I'll leave you with is what I say in those classes, every single one, and I start at the beginning, the answer is always the obstacle. The thing you are trying to hide is the thing that you should be putting forward. That's what's bringing your whole self to work is all about. You are incredible. And that means every bit of you is incredible your failures, your embarrassing moments, all of it. What got you here is everything you are. And everything you are is what will get you there. And you need to be embracing all of it. Be proud of it and show others it's okay to be proud of it. All right, we've got, I think, 10-ish minutes. I was so focused on not falling over. I have not, I know, Stacy, it's scary, I tell you, on days I don't have more than 300 calories. Um, I've not looked at the questions. I'm gonna scroll back or, uh, or put questions in the chat now. Oh, Lindsay, do you want to? Okay, great, Lindsay's on it. Lindsay's on everything. What would I do without Lindsay? Okay, why is it so hard for women mothers to put themselves first? Why is it often seen as a problem? Because of epic, epic gaslighting. The, I mean, real talk. We live in a country that doesn't think we're allowed to make medical decisions about our body. We live in a country that doesn't think we should make medical decisions of our body. So why on what signal would we have ever gotten from any moment of living in this country that it's okay to put ourselves first? We can't even put our health first. I mean, it is insane, epic gaslighting from birth that men and women do. I mean, let's remember what's happening with abortion. White women put us here. So it, there is internalized misogyny, right? The patriarchy is not just about men, it's about all of us. It is deep internalized misogyny. And you just need to develop a habit of calling it out. I mean, I and being like aware of it when it happens, because it's also like never going to stop. Um, I yes, I when I talked to um, Natalie about this event two days ago, I'm on this like health retreat doing something nice for myself because I'm burned out and I'm also working the whole time. But um, I got a call that uh, my youngest daughter has COVID. Oh my God, I feel like a failure. I feel like such a fucking failure. Three years I've been doing all of this to keep my children safe. And my youngest daughter has COVID. And I'm at a health retreat. And I can't be there to hug her. I can't be there to do any of that with her because her dad is doing that, which wonderful. They need that time together. He's doing amazing. They don't need me there. But still, how do I feel? Now, is that logical? No. But I am gaslit to think if they stub their toe, I have failed as a mother. Does their dad think that? No. I mean, it is just epic, epic, epic gaslighting. And so you just have to co constantly recorrect it. And I think especially if you're leading an organization and you're a woman, you need to publicly do it. You need to say things like, hey, I am going to go on vacation next week. And I know this is a rough time for the team, but I need to go on vacation at some point because I'm burned out. And I really want to model for my kids and for you guys that we take care of ourselves and that we're human beings too. Um, one thing I've started doing that I feel so much guilt about is I get up at 6 a.m. and go on two hour hikes every morning. 
it has become super important in terms of grounding myself, in terms of keeping myself sane. And the whole time I'm on that two hour hike, there is a part of that conscious brain telling me I should be working. But I also know, because I've been doing it for a few months, that that headspace allows me to be a better strategic thinker. And it's given me all these advantages beyond, you know, happiness. Um, and so it's like, it's a practice. You have to constantly correct that voice in your head and acknowledge this has been done to you. This is not you. This has been done to you. All right, here's another. How do I communicate to my boss colleagues that I take motherhood seriously, but I love my career and take that seriously too and want both without sounding defensive? So this is a great question. And I will say we have a... Um, I just want to shout out that we have an incredible course that starts next week called Negotiate Like a Girl that is basically research-based negotiation skills to have just these kind of conversations at work and get accommodations and flexibility and, oh yeah, the salary you deserve while not falling into that double bind of competence and likability and not signaling, oh, now she's a mom, she can't work as hard. It's caught by, taught by this amazing woman, Catherine Valentine, who is a nego private negotiation coach who makes $2,000 an hour and on average, on average gets women 30% salary increases. There actually is a research-driven way to have these conversations at work and not have the backlash. Um, I obviously can't get into all of it now, but I will tell you the, um, we actually have a free Zoom with Catherine tomorrow, Wednesday. So if you've got an hour, five o'clock Pacific time, come to that and you'll get more on this. But um, the, I think, the thing that I've picked up with Catherine is it's all about these communal asks, right? It's like you want to see that your boss isn't on the other side of the table for you and like the enemy of you and your kid time. You want to view it as what does the organization need holistically? So like you could go into a conversation and be like, hey, um, you know, I really love this company. I have done this, 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 point to your accomplishments you've done. Um, you know, I wanna be able to do this, this, and this, your future goals that are in your interest and the company's interest. But in order to do that, I need X. And that way you're not coming in and saying, hey, I'm a mom and you're not respecting that and I love being a mom. You're coming in as the whole package of you, the executive. Here's what you've done for them. Here's how much you love the company. You know these are the company's goals and this is what they can do to help you get to that level. So that may be, I need to be offline from five to seven. You know, think about how you couch that ask when you have that set up and you're putting it in the shared goals of the company and how both of you help you get help the y'all as a group get there versus this is bullshit. I'm a mom. I shouldn't be online these hours, which by the way is true, but this is really about getting results in an unfair world. I hope that made sense. Cleanse brain, but come to, uh, go to chairmanme.com. You'll find stuff about the event. Um, Catherine is absolutely like does these Jedi mind tricks on how women, again, using research that shows if you use these techniques, the risk of backlash falls to virtually zero, how women can just make asks. If there's no backlash, you could make asks all day long. As she says, you essentially become a white male. Um, time for one more. What's the biggest challenge you've had as a single working mother entrepreneur? Um, <laughs> I mean, it, this is so terrible that this is the obvious answer, but fundraising. 2% of venture capital goes to women. And I'm a white woman, we get the most of it. 2% of venture capital goes to women. There are very few industries in our unfair world where you face a 98% gender bias. And I'm telling you, it doesn't just hit me. You talk to people like Sally Krawcheck, she fights it in raising money for Elvis. Girl ran two of the five biggest banks on Wall Street, still gets mansplained too, still has VCs come, coming in and saying, oh, I don't know, you're a little too early for us. Let us know how we can be helpful. Fighting against a 98% gender bias is, I've never in my life done anything like that. I mean, never. Um, are we out of time? Do we have one more? I answered that one kind of quickly. No, that's a wrap. Okay, thank you all for joining. Okay, again, your homework, you're gonna write down five tangible things that you've gotten better at in your job as a result of being a mom. I can't wait to read them. Thank you, Hey Mama, for doing this. I guess that's it. Bye. Thank you, Stacey.